Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. You didn't plug in that. Why did it ask me to switch to... You're right to go, Andrew. Okay. Uh, thank you for joining in, uh, everyone, to this webinar today. We've had a few little technical issues uh, just at the moment. You may have heard a little chatter in the background there, but I think we're fine to go now. So thank you, uh, everyone, for joining in. My name is Andrew Forbes from the School of Public Health and Preventive Medicine at Monash Uni. And I'm the organiser of this session and be hosting it today together with Madeline Enright from ACTA, who's sitting right next to me here, who's really been key whole participation and the technology for this. So today's the second session in our so-called hackathon series about novel clinical trial designs, which is organised by the ACTA reference group on innovative trial designs. The purpose of this series is to present novel or innovative clinical trial designs at any stage of their development for trials that are already completed or in progress in the very long stages or just seeds of ideas. So the main objective of this series is to illustrate randomised trial designs that are smarter or more novel in some sense than the conventional two-arm parallel group design. So in today's session, we've got two speakers presenting their uh, innovations in trial designs. Uh, each speaker will present for about 20 to 25 minutes or so. And then after each presentation, we hope to have some uh, good discussion coming up. Now, in terms of discussion in your, uh, in your screen, you'll see that there is a comments or questions facility in the interface. And you can use that to submit questions uh, at any time during the talk or during the various talks or uh, at the end of the talk. So Madeline and I will gather them together and we'll, and we'll read out your questions after each presentation. So there won't be an audio facility, so please submit them in writing. And also for each talk, we've got a kind of online panel of two people to lead off the discussion and we'll do that first, followed by uh, questions that come in um, that you submit. If you've got any technical issues, then please also use the question box to let us know about that, and Madeline will be able to assist you um, via a, a chat session uh, offline. Uh, at the very conclusion of this whole session, there's going to be a pop-up window asking you to rate each presentation. The, uh, we're going to have like a People's Choice Award across the um, two innovative trial webinar sessions, so the one today and the one two weeks ago, and the winner of this People's Choice Award will be uh, invited to present their work and ideas at the ACTA International Conference in October later this year. Okay, that's it for the preliminaries. So let's get going now with the actual presentations. Our first speaker today is Dr. Jessica Kayser, who's a senior lecturer in biostatistics at the School of Public Health and Preventive Medicine. Uh, she obtained her PhD from the University of Adelaide. Then following that, spent a few years in Denmark working on graphical models, then returned to Adelaide for a short period of time to work on clustered data problems before she came across to uh, Monash University. Her current role principally involves statistical methods research, predominantly in the area of cluster randomised trials, which we'll talk about today. And uh, she's gained an international reputation for her work in just the space of a very few years. She's also actively involved as the principal statistician on a number of clinical trials in progress and in terms of sort of service to the discipline, she's the past president and current vice president of the Victorian branch of Statistical Society of Australia. So today she's going to talk about cluster randomised crossover trials. And in particular, when you have trials running over a fixed duration of time, what is the optimal number of crossovers in a cluster crossover trial? And our discussants at the end of uh, Jessica's presentation will be who you are. So I'll hand over to Jess now. 
Uh, thanks, Andrew. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Can I get someone to confirm that that you can hear me? Andrew, maybe? Yes, you call out and clear, oh. Jessica. Fantastic. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about how many times a cluster randomized trial should cross over. And this work is not all my own. Uh, it's been led by Kelsey Grantham, a PhD student here at Monash with Andrew and myself, who has really uh, done the bulk of this work. I'm very lucky to be able to present her results uh, today. Um, so she's been working with Andrew and myself here at Monash, but this works also uh, with Carla Hemming at the University of Birmingham over in the UK and Ed Litton, uh, an intensivist over in WA, has provided us with some uh, technical, well, some assistance on the uh, proposed trials that, that we'll be considering. Okay, so let's get stuck into things. So, well, before we get fully stuck into things, I want to just make sure we're all up to speed with the standard cluster randomised trial. So, standard cluster randomised trials, instead of assigning individuals to treatments, clusters of individuals are assigned to particular treatments. So here, treatment A or treatment B. So these clusters could be any sort of grouping of, of patients or participants. They could be intensive care units, schools, neighbourhoods, hospitals, anything you can imagine. So because we've got this clustering of patients, we no longer have complete independence of the observations of outcomes that we see for patients within these clusters. So we need to account for that when we uh, plan and analyze the data from these trials. So moving then over to the cluster randomized crossover trial. So the cluster randomized crossover trial is really useful because it allows us to get back some of the power that we lose from clustering in the standard cluster randomized trial. So the standard two period cluster randomized trial looks like this. So we've got clusters assigned to our first sequence, they start off in treatment A before switching over to treatment B, and clusters assigned to the second sequence of treatments start off in treatment B before switching over to treatment A. So in this work we're going to consider an idealised situation. We're going to assume we've got no carryover effect from treatment A to treatment B or from B to A, and that switches between treatments can occur quickly at the, the press of a button, the use of a, of a checklist, something like this, something that, that we can change without any delay. Okay, so the question is, the standard crossover design, cluster crossover design looks like this, we cross over once from treatment A to treatment B or from B to A, but should we be crossing over more than once? Is there anything to be gained from doing this? And another small caveat, I'm only going to consider designs that alternate with each period. So balanced crossover designs, designs that have sequences that go A, B, A, B, A, B, and B, A, B, A, B, A. So this is the setup that I'll be considering here. So let's think about whether or not we should be crossing over more than once. What do I mean by that? Well, is crossing over once enough? So suppose we've got K clusters assigned to each of these two sequences, and within each of these K clusters, we have M patients in that cluster. So is crossing over once enough? So if we were to do that, then half of the patients, so M on two patients within each cluster, would receive treatment A before swapping over, and the other half receiving treatment B, or, or the other way around for the second sequence. So is this enough? should we be crossing over three times? So having, should we have a four period design where one quarter of the patients within each cluster receive treatment before we switch to the other, to the other treatment that we're interested in? Or should we be crossing over after each patient, alternating with every single patient? So remember, we're considering a situation where we could feasibly swap between patients like this. So which of these is the best design? Well, the answer is, of course, it, de it depends. It depends on a whole bunch of things. And one of the things on which this depends is the within cluster correlation structure. So in standard cluster randomized trials, you may, if you're familiar with these, you may have heard of the intra-cluster correlation coefficient. So this is the quantity that describes the degree of similarity of the outcomes of any pair of patients within the same cluster. So this, this is the, the, um, a, a key ingredient of sample size calculations for standard cluster randomized trials. 
Now that we're starting to become more sophisticated in our understanding of cluster randomised trials and the fact that these cluster randomised trials uh, take place over stretches of time, we now start to think of the patients as arriving at the cluster and being included in the trial at different points in time. So when we start to think of, of things like of, of the, the trial proceeding in this way, something that occurs over time, we, we need to start thinking about the correlation, not just between any pair of patients, but the fact that the correlation, say, between the first and the second patient included in the, within a cluster included in a trial, may be different to the correlation between the first patient, the outcomes of the first patient and the last patient. There may be some difference between those two. And the within cluster correlation structure is an extension of the intracluster correlation coefficient that describes the similarity ma mathematically. So for any pair of subjects within a cluster, we can look at the within cluster correlation structure and pick out what their correlation is. So what do we expect this within cluster correlation structure to look like? Well, we've got a few choices that we could consider. But before we get to those, let's think about the arrival of these patients within a cluster. So we're gonna make another assumption and that assumption is that patients arrive at each cluster at a constant rate. So we've got our cluster K, patient one arrives is included in the trial, patient two, patient three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and so on. So these patients arrive in a sequence. And given this, we've got a few options for our within cluster correlation structure. The first option is a constant correlation model. So here I've got a bit of a diagram to graphically display what's going on. So here we've got our eight patients within cluster K, and here we've got the correlation between patient one and each of the other patients in the trial. So the correlation between the outcome of patient one and the outcome of patient one, so the correlation between patient one and themselves is going to be one. The correlation between the outcome of patient one and patient two is going to be some number rho here. And the constant correlation structure tells us that this correlation coefficient is going to be the same for any pair of subjects. So the correlation between patient one and patient two is going to be the same as the correlation between patient one and patient eight, even though some time has elapsed between the uh, inclu inclusion of these patients within, within this trial and the measuring of their outcomes. So this structure requires specifying one correlation only. This is really the, the standard intracluster correlation coefficient that we know from standard cluster randomized trials. So it's really a really convenient structure, but it may not be entirely realistic. We may not expect that this level of correlation will persist over time in this way. If we do assume this within cluster correlation structure, then changing the number of crossovers isn't going to have an impact on the power of the design. Whether you do that or not, is up to you, but you're not going to, to gain any power by going from a two period design to a four period design. So let's consider another correlation structure, a correlation that depends on design periods. So here again, we've got our individuals within cluster K, and now we're considering a two period crossover design. So this cluster has been assigned to the sequence where the first four patients uh, receive treatment A and the second four receive treatment B. So the, within, the, the correlation that depends on design periods tells us that the correlation between patients within the same period is going to be greater than patients within different periods. So patient one and patient two are in the same period here, their correlation is given by row one. However, patient one and patient five are in different periods, their correlation we may expect to be somewhat reduced and is given by some other correlation coefficient row two. And this is a really frequently applied assumption assumption for cluster randomized trials, particularly for these two period cluster randomized trials that, that we consider. But what happens to this, this structure if we change the number of periods? Well, let's take a look. What happens if we go from a two period design to a four period design? So now we've got patient one and two receiving treatment A, while patient three and four receive treatment B, five and six A, seven and eight B. So this correlation structure tells us that, well, patients one and two, they're in the same treatment period, so they're going to be correlated with uh, this correlation coefficient of row one. But, treat, but patients one and three, for example, are now in different treatment periods, so their correlation 
has reduced. The timing of their measurement hasn't reduced. Nothing, nothing has changed from the two period design, but because of this, this externally applied structure, we see this change in the correlation coefficient. So this sort of correlation structure that depends on design periods isn't really useful to help us answer the question of how many times a cluster randomized trial should cross over. This structure doesn't really make sense when we start to think of designs with differing number, numbers of periods that are conducted over the same duration of, of time. Okay, so what can we do? Well, we can consider a smoothly decaying correlation structure. So for this correlation structure, the correlation between patient outcomes depends not on the period, the, the externally defined treatment period, but rather on the actual amount of time between these patients' measurements. So you can see here that the correlation between patients, when we apply the smoothly decaying correlation structure, decays as the patients become further and further apart, are measured further and further apart in time. So patient one and patient two have a correlation coefficient of rho times some decay factor r, while patients one and eight have a correlation of rho times some, some base correlation rho times this decaying, um, this decay factor r to, to some power of seven. So this, this, rho, this r, this decay factor is a number that are less than one. So it's going to, these uh, correlations are going to decay the further apart in time these subjects are measured. And this is going to be the structure that we consider for the rest of this talk. Okay, so returning to the question, how many times should a cluster randomized trial cross over? Is once enough? Do we need to cross over three times? Do we need to cross over after each patient? Or perhaps somewhere in between the three and the each patient crossover? Well, the answer turns out to be we need to cross over after each patient. So the most efficient design the design that gives you the most bang for your buck is this one where you cross over after each patient. Okay, so we're done, we can go home. Well, even though crossing, over, crossing after each patient is the design that comes up as being the most efficient, let's consider a particular example and see just how much efficiency we gain when we cross over more and more times. So let's consider a specific example. So here we've got some noisy intensive care units and we're considering the length of stay of patients within hospitals after they've been in the ICU. And we're asking the question, does a noise abatement program in intensive care units reduce the log transformed hospital length of stay? So we're considering a two year cluster crossover trial, which is going to be run in Australian and New Zealand intensive care units. So this, this design is, this uh, particular trial is, um, is still in the planning stages. It hasn't actually been conducted anywhere. It's more of a, uh, a nice device for us to consider the impact of, of these crossovers here. So here we've got, uh, we've got ICUs within Australia and New Zealand. We've got two years to run the trial. ICUs are gonna switch between usual care and providing the intervention, where the intervention is this noise abatement program, which is essentially equivalent to giving patients some earplugs or perhaps some fancy noise cancelling headphones. So the idea being that if patients have more rest, ICUs are, are very noisy environments, lots of stuff is going on within the ICU. So patients aren't able to get perhaps particularly high quality rest. If patients can sleep more easily, will this reduce their length of stay? So given that this trial is to be run in Australia and New Zealand, we've got about 40 ICUs that could be available to help run, uh, help conduct this, this study. And within each of those ICUs, we expect to see about 1,000 patients a year. So within each of these 40 ICUs over the two year period, we would see 2,000 patients in total. And we assume that these patients arrive at a fairly constant rate into these ICUs. So we consider data from the Australian New Zealand Intensive Care Society Adult Patient Database. And this uh, data indicated that a decaying correlation structure fit the data well. It fit the data better than, than other potential options. So we found that we had this base correlation of 0.036, 
and a decay over the entire two years of 23%. So what does this actually mean? Well, this means that within, e within each ICU, the correlation between the first and the second patients was about 0.036, a little bit less than that because there was some decay between those two patients. But the correlation between the first patient and the last patient has dropped down to being less than 0.03 now. So we're able to capture with this decaying correlation structure that patients, the correlation between the outcomes of patients isn't going to be constant over this entire two year period. Okay, so given this specific example, what's the best design? Should we be looking at two periods with 1,000 patients in each cluster in each period, so just crossing over after each year? Maybe four periods with 500 patients, so six month length period, uh, periods of length six months, eight periods with 250 patients and so on, or is, is the best design that with 2,000 patients, 2,000 periods with one patient? Well, I've already told you that designs which cross over more frequently are more efficient. So this 2000 period design is the most efficient here. But what do I mean by efficient? Well, efficient is the design that gives us the highest power for a given effect size, power and, oh, sorry, there shouldn't be power here. This, uh, the most efficient design is the one that gives us the highest power for a given effect size and significance level. So let's take a look at this particular design. So here, What's going on? So in this plot, we've got the number of periods of the design. So we've got a two period design up to a 2000 period design. And we're looking at the variance of the treatment effect estimator. So the variance of the treatment effect estimator is the quantity that drives the sample size calculation. So the smaller this variance, the more powerful our design will be. So we can see here that for this particular setting where we've got a base correlation of 0.036 and this decay of 23% in, in correlation over the entire trial, that when we drop from two periods to four periods, we get quite a large decrease in this variance. So our design becomes a lot more powerful if we even go from a two period crossover design to a four period crossover design. Going to eight periods again gives us an increase in power we get another increase in power, it will increase in efficiency if we move to, to a 10 period design. And even though this 2000 period design where we cross over after each patient is the most efficient, we can see that we're really not gaining heaps of efficiency when we increase past even eight periods. So even though the 2000 period design is the best, it's really not that much better than an eight period design. Okay, so this is for a really particular uh, base correlation and decay. What happens if we change the decay, for example? So here now, instead of only considering this 23% decay, we've got a few different choices of decay. And we can see that we get really similar, um, we, get, we get really similar patterns. So even though the 2000 period design for each of these correlation decays is the most efficient, by the time we've crossed over eight times, we've kind of gotten all we can out of these crossovers. So for larger cluster sizes, higher base correlations and higher rates of decay, you're going to need more clusters to achieve a particular level of power, but uh, more crossovers, sorry, to achieve a particular level of, of power, but you're still gonna get a lot by crossing over more than once by having a four period design or an eight period design. So let's flip this plot around a bit. So now instead of considering the variance, we're considering the relative efficiency. So we're just considering the variance of each of these designs relative to the optimal 2000 period design. And we can see that we get some really highly efficient designs here, even for, for eight or 10 or even four crossovers. Okay, so that's fantastic, but Efficiency and variance and the variance of the treatment effect estimator aren't all that goes into considering uh, the, into, comes into consideration when we plan these, these designs. We can also think about trial costs and we can incorporate trial costs into our consideration here. So here we're going to suppose that we've got the cost of including a cluster in our study cost of including a subject in a study 
and there's some cost in crossing over from one treatment to another treatment. So our total cost is then some function of these three costs. So total number of clusters, total number of subjects, total number of crossovers. We need to consider how much each of these components costs when we're planning our design. So if we consider again this noisy ICUs example, we've, we'll suppose that we've got a total budget of about two and a half million dollars to run this, this study. So we can think about cluster costs. So we're going to suppose that clusters cost about two and a half thousand dollars. So this is the recruitment site coordination costs, uh, subject costs. So this is the cost of including each patient in the study. If we've got a routinely measured outcome, such as hospital length of stay, we wouldn't expect this to be too expensive, but subject costs may be more expensive if you're looking at, at some other, some other, maybe a subjective measure from patients, maybe maybe something else is, is far more expensive. Uh, and then we've got crossover costs as well. So these crossover costs are to do with actually implementing, the cost of actually implementing the crossover and ensuring that we're compliant within each of these clusters to the new treatment. Okay, so given all of this, what sort of study can we actually afford? How many crossovers can we afford? How many clusters can we afford? given this particular setting. All right, so what's going on in this plot? So this is another one of, of Kelsey's fantastic uh, figures. So here we've got number of periods of a design, and now we're looking at the number of clusters within each of these designs. So the color of each of these points is the relative efficiency of these designs, remembering that the design with, the, with 2000 crossovers uh, with 2000 periods rather, is the most efficient. So the darker the colour, the more efficient these designs are relative to the most efficient design. And you may notice that there are a lot of points that should be here that are not here. So we've only included designs here that we can actually afford that fall within, that fall under the two and a half million dollar budget that we have. So you'll notice that we can only afford with this particular budget to include 24 clusters at most. So although we have access to 40 clusters, given how much it costs to include these clusters within the study, we can't actually afford to include all of these clusters. So we're, we have at most 24 clusters within our design. And it turns out of the designs we can afford, this design right here is the most efficient. So 22 clusters, 40 periods, 50 subjects in each of these cluster periods. So with this design, we're crossing over about every two and a half weeks. So this design is most efficient. There are other designs with 24 clusters that, that cross over less frequently that are pretty much just as efficient as well. So what this plot tells us is that even though it can be, it, what this plot tells us is that it can be beneficial to increase the number of crossovers instead of increasing the number of clusters. So here if we, so even though we could include 24 clusters within our study, it's actually more beneficial to include 22 clusters and have them cross over more frequently. Okay, so what do I want you to take home from this presentation today? Well, the first thing is that these decaying within cluster correlations are often realistic and they're a choice that hasn't been considered much in the literature yet but they, they should be considered more frequently. You can gain efficiency by increasing the number of treatment switches in your cluster crossover design. Even moving from a two period to a four period, four period design is going to increase efficiency. And cost constraints can be incorporated when considering the best design for your study. So Kelsey's put together a fantastic online app where you can explore these results for your own trials and you're more than welcome to email me for a link to that. Before I finish, I'd like to just uh, highlight some selected references. If you want more insights into the decaying correlation structure that I've talked talk, that I've spoken about today, uh, you can find these two articles in Stats in Med and Statistical Methods in Medical Research. For more information on the cluster randomized crossover design, you can look at Sarah Arnup's fantastic uh, tutorial paper. And for more detail on the work, that I've talked about today, we've got a trial, uh, sorry, a paper that's currently under review, and I am willing to share preprints of that if you get in touch with me. So 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jess. Uh, beautifully presented, uh, innovative, uh, innovative cluster crossover designs and some practical optimality conditions there. So we've got um, two discussants uh, for yes, this, okay. but uh, uh, I'd like to also remind you that you can um, submit questions still on, online and what, while the discussants are uh, asking their questions and uh, we'll be able to um, get to your questions after that. So our two discussants today, the first is uh, Steve Webb, who's an ICU specialist and trialist at the Royal Perth Hospital and one of the founding directors of ACTA. And uh, also we have Julie, Dr. Julie Marsh, who's a biostatistician and a senior research fellow at the Telethon Kids Institute and has particular interests in a practical adaptive trial designs. So I might hand over to Steve or Julie, whichever of you wishes to go first. You go, okay, Julie. Maybe Steve. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, uh, uh, thanks, I Andrew. I think we haven't got any audio. Okay, try again. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, Steve, we can hear you. While well, we're trying to figure that out, Julie, if we got audio from you. Not any better. Um, I can hear Steve. No, I'm not Julie either. I, I can hear yeah, I think Julie and Andrew. Steve. Yeah, Steve and Julie go because we can hear yep. you. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Um, uh, Jessica, thank you for that um, presentation. Um, it was fabulous. It's okay, really so fascinating. Okay, so while we're trying to figure that out, although I'm involved in in this work, what oh. what's the most important aspect of all of this work, Jess? Where does it fit into the big picture of of trials? <laughs> oh, that's a that's a big question, Andrew. Um, well, can can I, I I can hear Andrew. I can hear. Uh, Julie and, and Steve as well. It seems that Andrew's the one who oh, yeah. can't uh, hear anyone else. Oh yes, no, I I can't hear now. <laughs> yeah, I was I, I muted I, I muted my own audio. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So well, Steve, we have you. Yes. So uh, the, the problem. Thanks very the, much, Andrew. Solely with my uh, technical illiteracy. <laughs> I'm sorry, Madeline. <laughs> Um, uh, Jessica, that was really beautifully presented. Thanks uh, very much. It was um, uh, for, for a non-statistician. Um, I found that really accessible. So, um, um, uh, so thank you for that. I've, I've just got to. I'll kick off with sort of um, two related questions. Mm -hmm. um, the first is sort of how sensitive um, is the analysis that you've provided? Uh, how sensitive is it to the issue of variability in the cluster period? Um, uh, size, so the number mm -hmm. of participants um, in each uh, cluster period and the extent to which that can either change within clusters um, or between clusters. And sort of the related question is that in many places it's much easier to switch from uh, A to B um, based on a regular um, calendar rather than um, number of patients recruited. Although clearly, if it was important uh, to, to maintain efficiency, it may be possible to um, organise the um, um, the changeover periods based on um, a number of recruited participants rather than um, a time interval. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that question. And I think what what we've assumed here in in working through all of this is that patients arrive at regularly spaced time points. So. If we're talking about 500 patients, say, we know that we've got 1,000 patients arriving within a year, 500 patients will arrive within six months. So we do have this regularly spaced uh, arrival time of patients. And what this implies is that the time and the number of patients end up being equivalent because we do have assumed that, that we've got these regularly spaced uh, arrival times occurring within all of the clusters. So hopefully that, that answers, uh, well, that talks about, I guess, a limitation of this work in that 
we are uh, conflating arrival times, number of patients with time periods. If patients aren't arriving at regularly spaced intervals, then you're right, things become a lot trickier because we no longer have the equivalence between the number of patients arriving and the time period. So in that situation, we, we, haven't, we haven't explored these results for that particular setting for when we do have irregularly spaced patients coming in. Um, thing, it, we, we certainly could. Um, so the results that we've presented are for this, this most standard case where we do have well, the, the easiest, most, most straightforward situation where patients are arriving at uh, a sequence of time points that is equivalent to the uh, length of, of periods. So were patients to arrive at irregularly spaced time points, I think you would certainly find that switching over more frequently than twice would increase your efficiency. How much this is going to increase your efficiency will depend on exactly when those patients arrive. You may expect that more patients will arrive in winter, for example, than in other times of the year. And you could certainly explore the results in that setting. But again, you would be gaining efficiency by switching over more than, more than once. So the direction of change is to, if there is, um, uh, irregularity to the um, um, rate of admission, um, the, the crossing over will, will tend to further increase efficiency. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so I think that's You're important. Anyone, anyone who's ever worked with me in an ICU will know that I have a certain type of magnetism um, that applies to the number of patients who come in when I'm, uh, when I'm uh, on shift. <laughs> So we need to need to model the Steve effect in, uh, in <laughs> well, the Steve times paradox. to arrival. <laughs> yeah, you, I, do I get to choose the Greek letter that's applied to uh, the Steve factor? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Julie, do you have uh, any questions to ask Jess? Well, again, very nicely um, represented and it definitely opens our eyes to, I should imagine, very few participants uh, listening ever would have even considered doing a crossover um, as a cluster randomised trial. Um, so that was very nice. I, I like the way that you did start simple. Um, if you add too many layers straight away, the main message is it can get lost anyway. And all those complexities can be addressed by trial simulation anyway. So it's beautiful to, to see the work early on as well. Um, I, I particularly like the strength that the time effects themselves can be modelled within this as well, because we often say what is the time effect in the clinical trial and we bash our heads about it, but that, I thought that was a very nice um, thing that you can measure within it as well. Um, the only thing that had me slightly alarmed is um, what the clinician's face looks like when you say the most efficient trial has 40 periods. How do you control contamination within cluster? I mean, we worry about it between clusters and also the, the short-term effects, the idea particularly in an ICU, ICU, you'd have to have all the previous patients um, out of the unit before the new sort of batch come in. Yeah, so these are, these are great questions. And I guess because we are considering a really simple scenario here those questions don't don't directly influence what we've what we've done but they are still very important these additional complexities actually running these trials in the real world and certainly there is probably no way it would be a, there would be a very limited number of of interventions that would feasibly lend themselves to a 40 period cluster randomized crossover trial but there may be uh many that lend themselves to a four period crossover trial. So even going from the two period to the four period leads to gains in efficiency. I guess that's one of the, the key points that I'd like to, to mention. Um, and this is of course all predicated on, on this decaying correlation structure, which we think is, is far more realistic than this constant correlation structure or this structure that depends on the the actual periods of, of the design, which, which doesn't seem to make too much sense. So, so the fact that, yes, I mean, these 40 period designs, even though they're the most efficient, are probably not the most feasible. Um, 
if there are issues such as, as contamination, so if we cross over from treatment A to treatment B, we may need to leave a washout period. So such things as that can be incorporated within the uh, within the planning of, of the trial and, and should be incorporated within the planning of the trial. But you'll still find that by increasing the number of crossovers, even if you do need to incorporate these washout periods, you'll still get gains in efficiency. So you may not be able to cross over as often for a given length of time, but by crossing over more than once, you're going to, to gain efficiency. So I'm just hammering that point home. I, I hope that answers the question. Absolutely. Andrew, have I got uh, time for one more question? Yes, yes, uh, that's fine. Unless there's any questions that have come through uh, from the audience. No, go, go ahead, Steve. Okay, th uh, thanks, Andrew. Um, uh, Jessica, um, I, I, I've come to um, have some level of appreciation for the um, uh, flexibility that is uh, created within an adaptive Bayesian framework where frequent interim analyses uh, can be conducted. Is there any way that it's possible to integrate um, frequent interim analyses without uh, excessive alpha spending so that uh, analysis could be updated periodically as the clusters are crossing over? Oh, look, I think this is a great idea. Uh, it's not something we've explored, but yeah, you may, you may think that, well, let's see what's going on. Let's see if we've got enough evidence after one year of running the trial after, you know, two or four crossovers, however many. I think, I think that's a great idea. And certainly you could incorporate those considerations in the planning of, of these crossover trials, um, you know, looking at the data after one year and, and seeing what's going on. Uh, but, but we've not yet looked at that in technical detail. So I can't really, uh, think, we, we do, we're not really sure what, what that would look like in terms of, of alpha spending. But you don't, within a frequentist framework, there would presumably need to be some alpha spending associated yes, yes. Uh, with that. Um, and then I guess a follow on question is, can the cluster crossover trial go the full Bayesian? Oh, I don't see why not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think so some of the work that, that we've been doing more recently, well, that Kelsey has been doing more recently is looking at uh, the Bayesian analysis of these multiple period uh, designs, multiple period cluster designs with particular focus on the stepped wedge. But when we do have these more complex within cluster correlation structures, it becomes even more important to, to put informative priors on these uh, intracluster correlations and on this within cluster correlation structure. So I think, I think we, do need to, we do need to start thinking in a more Bayesian way about, about these studies. Yeah, without having any um, uh, true appreciation of Bayesian statistics, for example, in the way that Ju uh, Julie does, I imagine the inf um, um, informative priors or constraints around the variance um, uh, may have very substantial influence on, um, on how the models uh, perform and operate. Yes, yes, this, for, for the, the settings that we're considering, this, this remains to be seen, but it is something we're, we, we are considering. Yeah, That's thanks, Steve, Thank for you. those. Yeah, thanks for those great questions. I mean, all of those things are on the uh, the the list in the agenda for uh, future research, especially um, the idea of evaluating multiple interventions simultaneously in the cluster crossed over framework, which then would lend itself towards um, multi-arm, multi-stage cluster randomized designs, which nobody has done yet, but there's no reason why that approach couldn't be uh, conceptually if it, uh, it's it's possible in the in the cluster setting yeah I'd, I'd just like to make a comment sort of um, broadly on behalf of the ICU community that we really love the, the cluster crossover design and we'd love to see a, a pathway to not being constrained to one question at one time <laughs> Right. <laughs> okay, thanks very much, Jessica and Steve and Julie for the, uh, for the discussion of that. We'll now, uh, it's about 11.15, so we'll turn to our second talk now. So our second innovative trial design talk is prevented, uh, presented by Professor Tom Snelling, who is a paediatric infectious diseases physician, and we'll see him in a moment, uh, at the Perth Children's Hospital 
and he's the director of the Telethon Kids Institute's West Farmer Center of Vaccines and Infectious Diseases. His main research areas are in the implementation of health policy and clinical practice, and in particular, the evaluation of vaccination and other public health strategies to minimize the burden of childhood infectious diseases. Tom was awarded an MRFF, Medical Research Future Fund grant from NHMRC earlier this year and leads the Bayesian Evidence Adaptive Trial to optimize the management of cystic fibrosis. So today he's going to present uh, ideas for individually randomized study designs that include patient preference in the treatment allocation scheme. So we'll hand over to you, Tom, now. Tom, we can't hear you. No, we can't hear you now. No, we can't hear you yet. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can, but you're getting feedback, so you've got a pick up, audio pick up, have somewhere else. Okay, how about now? Okay, how about now? Okay, how about now? Okay, how about now? Uh, we can hear you, but it's um, picking up again. So you, you've got two audio pickups in the room. How about now? Much better. No echo. I think okay. you're right to go. Good. Thank you. Now. Okay. Can you see my screen? Okay. Yes, perfect. Okay. So I'm having trouble advancing my slides now. Okay. So uh, imagine this scenario, you have uh, a patient, Mrs. Jones, who has high blood pressure that requires uh, treatment. Uh, and you consider recommending to her uh, either antihypertensive medication for control of her high blood pressure or a structured program of uh, exercise. And luckily for you, um, this uh, clinical question is uh, among the 5% of clinical decisions uh, that are made every day that uh, can actually be informed uh, by evidence from a randomised control trial. Uh, and on review of that uh, single randomised control trial, uh, you see that the trial found that uh, uh, patients who are randomly assigned to exercise had on average a uh, lower uh, blood pressure three months later uh, than those patients who are assigned to receive uh, antihypertensive uh, medication. Uh, but when you uh, look into the randomised control trial further, uh, you find that uh, there was no evidence in the trial that the effect of uh, exercise um, uh, was modified by age or by sex. Uh, but you do find that uh, of those uh, who were screened to participate in the trial, only 20% uh, were eligible uh, for various uh, uh, reasons. Uh, and that of those who were eligible, 
only 20% uh, agreed uh, to be randomised uh, to either uh, exercise or to antihypertensive treatment. Luckily for you, uh, Mrs Jones has none of the factors that excluded 80% of the patients uh, from the randomised uh, control trial. Um, but the question remains whether the results of the trial are still uh, applicable to her. Uh, and uh, arguably, in order to know whether the results of the trial were applicable to, applicable to her, you have to ask her whether she would agree to having her treatment randomised, because the only people who took part in the clinical trial were people who were happy to either receive medicine uh, or to receive exercise. Uh, people who were uh, had a preference uh, for one or the other, who didn't have some degree of equipoise, uh, excluded themselves from the trial, presumably. And if their response to treatment is different from those who were happy to have their treatment uh, randomised, then arguably the results of the trial would not be applicable uh, to them. So if she responds yes, that she would be happy to have uh, treatment uh, randomised with a flip of a coin or uh, otherwise, uh, then we could answer that she's probably better off uh, with exercise. Um, but what if she actually has a strong preference for medicine? Maybe, for example, she knows that uh, she's not the sort of person who uh, adheres to exercise regime. She's never exercised in her life. Uh, and so she is doubtful that uh, exercise uh, will work uh, for her. Could we still say in that setting that she would be better off uh, on the exercise? And I think we'd have to say that actually we don't know because patients like her weren't included in the original randomised control trial. So the problem uh, that is generic uh, to all of uh, clinical uh, research and clinical medicine is that there are too many questions and there are not enough trials. And that a further problem, uh, and one that probably we don't think about enough, is that trials only accept those who will accept randomization. Uh, but uh, having true uh, equipoise, true indifference to the treatment options uh, is, uh, is probably rare and that probably affects who takes part in these trials uh, and who, who doesn't. Uh, so many people are excluded by us as trialists from clinical trials uh, to minimise the variation in treatment responses, uh, but uh, in addition to that, uh, many patients may exclude themselves from clinical trials because they have uh, a, a preference for one treatment um, over the other. Uh, and so that has uh, an impact on the efficiency of uh, doing uh, clinical trials. Uh, but worse, if the treatment preference modifies the effect of treatment, uh, then the observed treatment effect in the clinical trial might not reflect the expected treatment effect for a given patient who may have a treatment uh, preference. Uh, and also, uh, it may not actually reflect the average treatment effect, ignorant of uh, treatment preference, uh, because you might have uh, a, um, a selected a group of patients uh, who, have, uh, who are indifferent and whose uh, treatment response is different from the broader group of patients who have a preference uh, for one treatment uh, or the other. Uh, so you may, for example, in this situation, find that people who really uh, prefer medicine uh, actually are better off on medicine uh, because they don't adhere to uh, exercise um, uh, programs. So the question, the challenge for us as clinical trialists is whether we should, and if so, how we should uh, could uh, factor uh, preferences for treatment uh, in order to give unbiased uh, average uh, treatment effects uh, or conditional treatment effects, treatment effects conditional on treatment preference, and how 
uh, by uh, allowing people to nominate a preference for treatment, we might um, optimise uh, participation in trials uh, and not exclude people who have a preference for one treatment uh, or another. So thinking about this problem uh, through use of causal diagrams, here we have uh, a treatment and we're trying to uh, estimate uh, or measure the causal effect of the choice of treatment, either medicine uh, subs uh, uh, denoted by the M subscript or exercise denoted by the E subscript uh, on uh, blood pressure uh, or at least the change in blood pressure after three months on the treatment, for example. And so we imagine that there are uh, risk factors uh, for uh, blood pressure, but risk factors that don't have any causal uh, influence on choice of treatment. Uh, and so uh, they wouldn't uh, uh, confound the effect of treatment uh, on blood pressure, but measuring those risk factors might uh, help us to uh, have uh, better precision on our estimates of treatment effect. And there might also be factors that are associated with the treatment, like uh, access uh, to medicines or exercise to exercise facilities, uh, which influence treatment, but which don't uh, influence uh, the, uh, the response to uh, treatment, don't influence the blood pressure um, outcome. But uh, more importantly for us, uh, in terms of trying to estimate average treatment effects, uh, we imagine that uh, uh, outside of a clinical trial, outside of randomization, there might be other factors, um, confounders uh, that influence both the choice of treatment uh, and also the blood pressure. And failing to properly account for those confounders uh, would uh, bias our measure, measured um, uh, average uh, treatment effects. Uh, and we can imagine that there might be some confounders that we can accurately measure and that we can uh, stratify or um, uh, adjust for, um, but there might be other confounders that are unknown or unmeasurable and failure to adjust for those confounders uh, biases our measures of treatment effect on blood pressure in the absence of randomization. So one way uh, of thinking of this uh, problem uh, is that those factors that would otherwise uh, confound um, the uh, measurements of, of the causal effect of treatment on blood pressure uh, could be summarised as uh, the preference for treatment. So these are the factors that determine whether someone has a preference for uh, receiving medical treatment or for exercise uh, and which have uh, uh, in the real world, uh, under normal consist, uh, conditions, have a deterministic uh, relationship with the treatment that the patient actually receives. So someone prefers medicine, uh, assuming that um, both options are available to them, then they will receive medicine uh, outside of a clinical trial. And those who prefer to uh, exercise, uh, have exercises their treatment uh, in a deterministic um, uh, uh, way. So the problem there is that uh, we never in the real world, uh, we generally don't observe what would happen to people who prefer or intend to receive medicine, but who actually have exercise and those who prefer or intend to have exercise, but who for whatever reason uh, receive medical treatment uh, instead. And so um, even though the literature talks about um, preference, uh, maybe another way of thinking about this is intention. Uh, so uh, uh, these factors C1 and C2, in addition to influencing the blood pressure, also have a direct causal influence on uh, your intention to receive medicine uh, or exercise, which, uh, which has a direct deterministic um, uh, relationship with uh, the treatment that you receive. So um, some of the following um, trials, or most of this um, uh, has been nicely summarised in this paper from a couple years ago from um, people at uh, McMaster and uh, at Sydney University. Um, 
and I've tried to abbreviate the nomenclature uh, a little bit uh, just for um, just for brevity. So um, uh, so apologies to the authors, but um, uh, if you want to uh, dig down into the details, I refer you back to that um, that paper. So uh, this is the basic setup that uh, any individual um, their uh, change in blood pressure after three months, uh, they say is a factor of mu, which is the uh, change in blood pressure that would be expected for someone who wants to have medicine, intends to have medicine and actually receives medicine. Um, plus uh, the uh, additional effect uh, on the blood pressure of the treatment they receive, uh, which in this context, uh, uh, if, if they receive uh, exercise, uh, counter uh, contrary to their um, to their intention or preference to have medicine, uh, then uh, tau represents the additional effect on their measured blood pressure. Uh, omega uh, reflects uh, the effect of um, uh, uh, what the authors uh, call selection, but it's basically measures the additional effect of uh, wanting to uh, have uh, exercise as opposed to wanting to have medicine. What effect does that uh, have on the measured blood pressure? And pi is effectively the interaction between those things. And it's uh, the authors call this a preference effect. And basically it measures the additional effect on the blood pressure uh, if you actually get uh, what you want. Um, in this context, if you uh, want to um, have exercise uh, and you actually receive exercise, uh, so that's entertaining the possibility that um, that, uh, that also impacts on, uh, the, uh, on the measured outcome. Uh, and then you have an error uh, term. So the I uh, represents the treatment uh, that you um, uh, that you receive. The J subscript is the treatment that you want uh, and K is uh, for an individual uh, patient, um, patient K. So um, under a conventional randomised trial, um, uh, you have eligible patients and then of the eligible patients, you have a subset who are prepared to be randomised because they have some degree of equipoise about the relative merit of uh, treatment A and B and they're randomised and they take whatever treatment or they should take whatever treatment they're, uh, they're randomised to. Uh, so that is uh, denoted here. So we ignore what the uh, intended treatment is uh, and we just uh, provide a, a random assignment uh, which directly determines the treatment uh, that is uh, given and that the patient receives. Uh, so uh, under that situation, uh, what you have, what you measure is uh, effectively um, the effect of treatment in the subgroup of patients who preferred uh, uh, medical treatment, uh, which is uh, this group uh, here and you have uh, an effective treatment in the subgroup of patients who preferred uh, exercise. Um, uh, uh, and then what you really have is um, uh, an overall effect here, which is the difference here between those who uh, receive the exercise intervention uh, and those who receive, uh, receive medicine, uh, which is in effect uh, a weighted um, a change in blood pressure, uh, which is weighted by the proportion of people uh, in the subset who wanted medicine uh, and the subset of people who wanted uh, exercise. What we don't uh, measure in a conventional trial is what the preference was, uh, what the intended treatment was. Uh, and so we can never know um, from a conventional trial whether there is a modification of the treatment effect by treatment uh, preference. Uh, so here, the um, uh, effective treatment amongst those who want medicine is the difference between um, this uh, cell and this cell, so it's just tau, uh, whereas here, uh, the difference between um, the effect uh, uh, of exercise versus the effect of medicine is uh, tau 
plus uh, this pi term, which you'll remember is the effect of not only wanting exercise, but receiving uh, exercise. Uh, so there is potentially a difference in the effect uh, between the two subgroups uh, that, we, uh, that we never actually um, observe in a conventional trial and which might be uh, important. The other thing that's important is that this measured average effect um, over here, um, uh, because it uh, uh, is a weighted um, effect between those who would prefer medicine uh, versus those and those who would prefer exercise, um, it's dependent on uh, that ratio being reflective of the ratio uh, in the entire population that you're wanting to apply these uh, effect estimates to. Um, and if this uh, treatment population is actually just enriched in people who are relatively indifferent to medicine or exercise, uh, then in fact, uh, this average treatment effect uh, might actually be very misleading and not applicable to the broader treatment um, population uh, at all, even if you are ignorant of their preferred treatment. So what the um, authors um, uh, describe is a couple uh, alternatives where you actually elicit the uh, preferences for treatment. Uh, and in what they call the fully randomised preference design, uh, you have uh, eligible patients. Now these are patients, again, who have to be willing to accept the randomised treatment. And so this is not necessarily reflective of the broader population of patients. Uh, but what you do before you randomise them is that you elicit their preference for treatment A or B, uh, and then you randomise them and then you analyze them according to their stated preferred treatment. It's important that you elicit the preferences before you actually randomize them uh, so that um, the elicited preferences have not been influenced by their randomized uh, treatment uh, assignment. And so um, because you've elicited the preferred treatment uh, in, or the intended treatment, um, or at least what they've uh, stated uh, that they prefer, uh, then you can actually measure the treatment effect both in those who state that they prefer medicine uh, and in the group who state that they prefer uh, exercise. Uh, and so, um, uh, and so uh, if you can elicit from your patient whether they prefer medicine or they prefer exercise, then data from a trial like this might actually be more informative uh, for predicting uh, their treatment response uh, to either medicine or to exercise. The problem with this design is that uh, the intended or the preferred treatment is only a stated uh, preference or a stated intention. And there's a question about whether, uh, an uncertainty about whether what someone says that they uh, would prefer to receive is truly indicative indicative of, of their true intention, uh, especially if that stated preference or intention actually has no consequence. So it's very easy for someone to say that they would be um, uh, happy and prefer to uh, receive exercise if, there's, uh, if they're actually gonna have randomized um, uh, treatment and that stated preference actually has no, uh, no impact uh, or no influence on the treatment that they actually receive. Uh, and it may not actually be truly reflective of what they would have actually received if they hadn't received ref um, uh, randomized treatment. So to overcome that problem, um, a, what is uh, described is this two-stage two randomized design. So again, uh, amongst eligible patients, uh, everyone who agrees to take part in this trial has to agree to accept randomised treatment. Uh, and so again, we are left with a subset of patients uh, who presumably don't have strong feelings one way or the other about the treatment they receive. Uh, and then they are randomised firstly to either have the treatment that they want. Um, so uh, the group that are randomised uh, to receive the treatment they want are uh, denoted here. Those who choose A receive A, those who choose B receive B. Those who are randomised to a random group are randomised once again, uh, and then they are, uh, need to um, take the treatment that they are uh, assigned to. So again, this is 
uh, restricted to a population of people who are happy to receive or say that they would be willing to receive a treatment that is contrary to their preferred uh, treatment. And so uh, in this uh, setup, uh, what you measured, uh, what you measure amongst those who get to choose their treatment is the observed effect uh, amongst those who want medicine and receive medicine, uh, those who want uh, exercise and receive exercise, and then amongst the group who are uh, um, receive randomised treatment, um, uh, you measure this uh, this uh, this overall uh, overall effect, uh, and you haven't ascertained their preferred treatment, and so it's similar to a conventional uh, design where you get some uh, weighted um, uh, average effect uh, across a group of patients who. Um, uh, who want medicine and a group of patients who want uh, want exercise. Uh, but if you measure all of those things, you can actually uh, work backwards and calculate what the effect of treatment, uh, what the effect of exercise would be in those who want medicine uh, and what the effect of um, uh, medicine would be uh, in those who want to receive um, exercise. Uh, so this is actually goes uh, a long way uh, forward in um, being able to um, to uh, work out for a given patient with a given preference uh, what is actually the best uh, treatment to them. The, uh, the problem with this design is still everyone has to agree to accept randomization um, because they don't know if they're going to be assigned to the random treatment group or the uh, choice um, group. Um, and so again, you may effectively eliminate from the trial uh, people who have a strong preference for one treatment uh, or, or another. Um, so for completeness, um, uh, they describe also this partially randomised preference design uh, where you have eligible uh, patients, uh, you have, um, uh, you elicit their stated preferences from, from, from everyone. Uh, and you entertain the possibility that some people do have true equipoise. They state no preference one way or the other, and they're randomised and they receive whatever treatment they're randomised to. Uh, but for those people who do have a preference, they're not randomised. Uh, they just receive the treatment that they are uh, assigned to. Um, and so what you have here is uh, groups of patients who either have a preference for medicine, uh, or have a preference for exercise or who are completely undecided uh, and you entertain the possibility that the treatment effects of uh, or difference of treatment of exercise over medicine is different across those uh, strata um, and uh, uh, at least in the undecided group you can quantify the benefit of exercise uh, over medicine but in those who um, uh, express a preference for medicine or exercise uh, because you never observe what happens uh, uh, in those who receive treatment contrary to their preference. Uh, you can't actually measure the benefit of exercise over medicine or vice uh, versa. Uh, so this is not a, um, not a complete um, a solution to the problem. So what I uh, want to do um, in the remaining time is uh, to disqualify myself from this um, from this exercise by rather than uh, proposing a, a, a trial solution is to uh, propose an engineering solution uh, to this problem uh, in the form of this uh, thought exercise. So I uh, want to propose this uh, machine. Uh, the machine is uh, Dr. Klipper. Now, CLUPA uh, stands for Closed Loop Probabilistic Treatment Recommender. And Dr. CLUPA systematically collects treatment and outcome data for every patient that she treats. Uh, and in fact, because she uh, exists in the virtual world, she can actually, uh, she can actually treat uh, many, many patients uh, across uh, time and, uh, and space. Where there are two or more treatment options for a given uh, clinical condition or scenario, she compares the effectiveness of each uh, of those treatments 
and calculates a probability that one treatment is better uh, than, the, uh, than the other treatment. So Mrs. Jones is undecided about uh, exercise to manage her hypertension and so uh, she goes and asks Dr. Kluper to provide a clue about whether medicine or exercise would be best for her. And what Dr. Kluper does is uh, uh, gives a clue about whether medicine or exercise is best based on all of the data that Dr. Kluper has accumulated over time about people in her situation who have had to make a decision about medicine or exercise to measure their blood pressure. The clue that she gives is uh, random uh, and it has probability for each uh, treatment option which is approximately equal to the probability that that recommendation results in the best outcome. So for example, uh, if those who have been recommended by Dr. Kluper to receive exercise uh, have had better outcomes than those who have been recommended to receive medicine, uh, then the probability that she recommends exercise uh, is, uh, is higher than the probability that she recommends medicine. And that probability increases uh, over time uh, as she accrues uh, more and more data and more more support uh, for, um, for exercise uh, over medicine uh, and that, um, that, uh, that probability informs the ratio, uh, the proportion of the time that she recommends uh, exercise uh, rather than medicine. If or when uh, one recommendation is clearly associated with a better outcome, uh, then she will always recommend that that, uh, that, that, um, that treatment option. So if she's already accumulated data uh, that says with greater than 97.5% probability, uh, exercise is better than medicine, uh, then she will always recommend uh, exercise. So in order for Dr. Kleeper to give a clue or a recommendation, First, Mrs. Jones has to provide a preference uh, or an intention. Uh, she has to nominate uh, what uh, she uh, thinks is likely to be best for her. Uh, the other rule that Dr. Kluper applies is that she will only ever give one clue uh, per patient. Uh, but the important thing is that uh, Mrs. Jones is free to accept or reject the clue. Uh, Dr. Kleeper, unlike uh, other doctors, never gets offended if the treatment recommendation is, uh, is, is ignored. The other thing is that because Dr. Kleeper is a machine and runs with minimal uh, um, uh, running costs and maintenance costs, there is actually no cost to requesting this uh, clue. Uh, Mrs. Jones doesn't have to pay anything and there's no obligation for her to actually follow uh, the uh, follow the clue. So this is like uh, looking out the window in the morning before deciding whether to take an umbrella uh, to work with you or not. When you look outside, uh, you see it's overcast, uh, you know that that's uh, not a perfect predictor of whether it will rain or not, uh, it's just a clue and you can either accept or reject that clue and decide to take your umbrella or not to take your uh, umbrella to work. So in this machine, uh, what we have are two factors that are influencing the treatment that Mrs. Jones receives, both her preference or her intended treatment, which may itself uh, be confounded by factors that also influence the blood pressure. Uh, but she also receives this clue uh, from, uh, from the robot um, which uh, uh, is a, a randomised clue and so uh, it's not causally influenced by any other factors. Uh, the only factor that influences the clue is the probability that that treatment is actually, or at least the probability that that recommendation will result in a positive outcome uh, for that patient given data that's been accumulated over time. So, um, uh, this uh, basically acts, the clue acts uh, as, uh, as an instrumental variable 
uh, its effect on the outcome, the blood pressure, uh, can't be confounded by preference or any other factors. Uh, and in the case of a continuous outcome, uh, if you really wanted to, you could, um, uh, you could use the uh, effect of the clue on the final blood pressure to estimate the effect, the causal effect of the treatment uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the blood pressure. The aim of the clues closed loop feedback uh, is not though to compare the effectiveness of medicine versus exercise uh, um, uh, received, uh, it's actually to estimate the effectiveness of the recommendation that the robot gives of medicine uh, versus exercise. Uh, as I said before, there's no cost uh, to uh, obtaining this clue from the robot uh, because it can be ignored. Um, and so it should be universally accepted. So even if Mrs. Jones has a preference for one treatment or another, uh, because there's no obligation for her to accept uh, the, the clue, uh, even those who strongly prefer one treatment or, or another uh, should, um, as there should be no barrier to them uh, receiving this random uh, treatment uh, recommendation. She, she can do no, no worse by taking that, uh, that clue. Um, so if there are only two options, uh, even if her preference is medicine, but she receives a clue um, uh, that is uh, for exercise, then that gives her some evidence uh, that uh, exercise may actually be better than medicine for her. Um, and she can either agree to accept that uh, or reject that piece of, uh, piece of evidence. So the problem here though is what if people have a preference for medicine or exercise and that preference actually influences uh, their uh, response to treatment? Could knowing the treatment preference actually improve the recommendation uh, that the robot gives? And so you imagine then uh, that uh, rather than two or three uh, strata of patients, um, because Mrs. Jones has revealed uh, her intention, whether she is going to have, uh, uh, whether she wants medicine or exercise. In fact, uh, you could um, do that in a more granular way by uh, trying to um, elicit from her, not just a preference, but actually the strength of the preference. Uh, so you can imagine you might have five subgroups, uh, one uh, a group of um, patients who are completely uh, indifferent, completely undecided, uh, those who are hedging uh, towards medicine, those who are hedging towards exercise. Uh, and then you can imagine there might be a group of patients who feel strongly uh, in favour of medicine and those who feel strongly in favour of surgery. Then um, they all receive uh, this random uh, treatment uh, assignment. And that treatment assignment is based on data that's gathered over time about patients who are in their strata um, uh, and where the effect of treatment might actually be different across those strata. Uh, but you can imagine in a Bayesian uh, hierarchical structure, you could actually um, improve efficiency of estimating the effects in each of these uh, strata uh, by borrowing uh, information uh, across the strata. You might find that those who have a strong preference for medicine, uh, if they receive, uh, that they actually uh, tend to ignore the uh, treatment recommendation. And so you actually observe relatively little uh, information about those who strongly prefer medicine, uh, but who actually uh, have uh, exercise. And likewise, those who strongly prefer exercise uh, but uh, are assigned and actually receive medicine, at least at first. But as the uh, robot uh, matures and collects more and more data, and as the um, patients gain confidence in the clue uh, that the robot is giving, that in fact you can start potentially to um, uh, nudge people, even with strong preferences, to actually uh, to actually take the assigned treatment, uh, even if it's contrary to their uh, preferred, preferred treatment. Um, so that's the thought experiment. Um, the summary is that treatment intentions or preferences 
might influence treatment responses, they might impact on participation in clinical trials and therefore bias the measured average treatment effects that we ascertain in conventional clinical trials. Uh, there are designs that factor in preferences and these may help, but they are imperfect uh, for various reasons. Uh, and it may be that rather than using uh, randomization uh, as a um, uh, as a deterministic uh, thing that you you must uh, accept the um, the uh, treatment assignment that you are randomised to. If instead we use it uh, in an instrumental sense, um, where we uh, take into consideration uh, that the treatment that a person receives is a function of both uh, the random assignment and their treatment preference, uh, then we might be able to uh, firstly optimise participation by allowing people to override their treatment assignment, uh, as well as capture any uh, 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 modification of treatment effects uh, by people's elicited uh, uh, intentions and treatment preferences. Thanks very much, Tom, for uh, a really interesting talk and for your uh, Dr. Kluper thought experiment. I noticed you've got the trademark already registered for the uh, <laughs> for the process. Um, now, just in terms of procedural things, at 12 noon, we're probably going to be cut right off from this webinar. So I'll hand straight across to Steve Webb for um, any questions you might have, we've only got a couple of moments for it. But uh, Steve, we got Steve in. Yeah, I, um, uh, I, can you hear me, Andrew? Yes, yes, far yep. away. So, so Tom, um, and maybe we can take this offline. I'm not sure I completely understood why the instrumental variable is is not capable of being confounded by either uh, um, in, uh, treatment preference or intentional factors that influence. Um, uh, intention, but um, I, the, my question is whether or not um, uh, that's an issue that can be evaluated empirically uh, through simulation. Uh, yeah, I mean the whole thing needs to be evaluated through simulation in the first instance. The, the important thing about the clue that the robot provides is that it's random. Uh, and so by definition, it's not influenced by any uh, treatment preferences or, uh, or access or availability uh, issues or, or anything that affects the outcome in itself. The only effect of the treatment uh, assignment or the clue uh, on the blood pressure is through the treatment that is actually, it's influence on the treatment that is, that is given. Okay. Just one quick comment here, we're gonna to have to wrap up in a moment. Um, do you think with uh, electronic, me electronic medical records and all this sort of so-called real world evidence that uh, a Dr. Kluper could actually exist in the relatively near future? I wouldn't say relatively near future. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, it would completely change the way that uh, that, that we practice and, and, and for ethics committees to get their heads around uh, this, uh, this clue, this recommendation that's provided uh, would, uh, could, could probably melt their, melt their brains. So, um, but the thing is, if uh, someone is freely allowed to ignore the recommendation, uh, then do you actually need consent for them to participate in this process at all? Or is this just like uh, doing a CRP or a or a blood test or a haemoglobin where the, uh, the, uh, the, the response that you get uh, changes your probability uh, of a diagnosis or of a predicting a treatment outcome, uh, but we don't expect it's going to be a deterministic thing, it's, it's probabilistic. And, and so I would argue that we could just uh, put, embed this within routine care, not call it a clinical trial, not call it a uh, and not and 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 get uh, not not require consent for people to to participate in in this uh, in this uh, in this work. Yeah, right. I've got a whole list of other issues that I could ask here. Maybe we'll do some of that offline. But we're going to have to wrap up before we get cut off. So I want to um, 
thank both speakers today. Thank Jess and Tom for their uh, really interesting presentations. And thanks to and our uh, panelists as well. And thanks to everyone for joining in. And please don't forget to uh, look at the screen that comes up when you uh, log out of GoToWebinar and provide a score there. And we look forward to seeing you at the next ACTA web webinar event, which I believe is going to be in July. And uh, Scott Berry from sort of Berry Consultants in the USA is going to be presenting uh, a discussion of the recent FDA draft guidelines on adaptive trials. So um, look out for this on the ACTA website. For, uh, for information, um, which should be coming fairly shortly and the webinar will be sometime during July. So thank you very much everyone and I uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks, bye.